Section 28 of Pantrophion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Pantrophion by Alexis Soyer. Beverages, of which water is the foundation. Water is certainly the most ancient beverage, the most simple, natural, and the most common, which nature has given to mankind. But it is necessary to be really thirsty in order to drink water, and as soon as this craving is satisfied, it becomes insipid and nauseous. What is then to be done? Cyrus would have said, drink no more. So would a teetotaler of the present day. In the first ages of the world, the human race, bound by no oath of temperance, succeeded by sheer application of their ingenuity in finding something better, or perhaps worse, according to the ideas of certain moralists, whose wise teaching, however, commands respect. Certain it is that water, continuing to be regarded with peculiar favour, was called to play a principal part in various combinations by which it lost its insipidity and inoffensive properties, and acquired the wonderful power of provoking a sort of madness, known by the name of drunkenness. Those beverages which man imbibes when he is no longer thirsty, which cloud his weak mind, and render him ill when in good health, are called fermented liquors. Beer is one of the most ancient. If we are to believe Diodorus of Sicily, Bacchus himself invented it. However, it is certain that the absolute injunction not to drink wine caused the inhabitants of Egypt to have recourse to a factitious beverage obtained from barley, often mentioned in history under the name of Zytham and Kurmi, and whose invention has been often attributed to Osiris, which means that its precise origin is entirely unknown. It was a kind of beer composed of barley, and capable of being preserved for a long time without decomposing, for instead of hops, utterly unknown in that country, a bitter infusion of lupins was added. The Egyptians also used Assyrian corn in its composition, and probably other aromatic plants, in which each one followed his peculiar taste. The method of brewing varied much among them, but the one here mentioned was that most generally in use to procure Zytham in Lower Egypt, where it was converted, like our beer, into vinegar, which the Greek merchants of Alexandria exported to the European ports. The Egyptians long drank nothing but this fermented liquor, because the followers of Osiris believed that when Jupiter crushed the Titans with thunderbolts, their blood, mixing with the earth, produced the vine. They invented the Zytham as a substitute for wine. It is not probable that the Greeks, whose wines were so renowned in antiquity, thought much of beer. Nevertheless, Aristotle mentions drunkenness being caused by drinking a beverage drawn from barley. Aeschylus and Sophocles mention a liquor procured from the same cereal. The use of beer spread rapidly in Gaul, where wine was but little known before the time of Probus. The Emperor Julian, governor of this country, acquaints us of this fact in an epigram. The Spaniards and the Aborigines of Brittany and Germany also delightfully intoxicated themselves with an infusion of barley, called by the first of these nations Kilia, Syria, Cerevisia, and Kurmi by the two latter. These various denominations signify literally strong water, and this fermented drink was common to the nations just indicated. All the people of Western Europe drank a strong liquor made with grain and water. The manner of preparing it was not the same in Spain, in Gaul, and elsewhere, but everywhere it possessed the same dangerous properties. Man, says Pliny, is so skilful in flattering his vices that he has even found means to render water poisonous and intoxicating. The Danes and Saxons gave themselves up to an enormous consumption of Zytham and Kurmi, kinds of ale and beer, 
varying in no other respect than in the manner of preparing them the warlike piety of their ingenuous and coarse-minded heroes desired no greater recompense after a life of fatigue and rough combats than to sing the praises of odin amidst eternal banquets where these exhilarating beverages might unceasingly maintain the joy and bravery of the warriors the ancient britons had many vines but they esteemed them only as ornaments to their gardens and they preferred, says Caesar, the wine of grain to that of grapes. It is historically demonstrated that the English, at a very early epoch, applied themselves to the making of beer. It is mentioned in the laws of Ina, chief or king of Wessex, and this liquor held a distinguished rank among those that appeared at a royal feast in the reign of Edward the Confessor. Under the Normans, ale acquired a reputation it has ever since maintained. Two gallons cost only one penny in the cities. In the country, four gallons might be obtained at the same price. Happy age! Happy ale drinkers! At that period, the golden age for the apostles of the Britannic Bacchus, the brewers rendered no account of the preparation of this beloved beverage. The English nation did not yet purchase the right of intoxicating themselves. It was not till the year 1643 that this authorization was to be bought. The use of hops would appear to be of German invention. They were employed in the Low Countries in the beginning of the 14th century, but it was not till the 16th that they were appreciated in England. Can it be true that beer or ale possessed, in certain cases, strange curative properties? we find the following fact in a statistical account of Scotland. A poor coal miner in the county of Clackmannan, named William Hunter, had been long suffering with acute rheumatism, or obstinate gout, which deprived him of the use of his limbs. The eve of the first Monday of the year 1758, some of his neighbours came to pass the evening with him. Ale was drunk, and they got merry. The jolly fellow never failed to empty his glass at each round. Scotch ale is a seductive drink, and as perfidious as pleasure. It bewilders the senses, and finally masters the reason. William Hunter lost his completely, but his legs were restored, and he was able to make marvellous use of them for more than twenty years. After that happy evening, never did his old enemy, the gout, dare approach him and the worthy coal-miner took care to keep it at a distance by reiterating the remedy which had proved so beneficial. Nobody could blame him. Ale had become so dear to him. Gratitude and prudence combined to make it a duty to remain unalterably attached, and he was faithful to it till he breathed his last. Antecedent to the use of hops beer was made in England as follows. Quote, to make a hogshead of strong ale. It was necessary, first of all, to make the grout, which was thus done. Nine gallons of water was to be well boiled, and put into a brewing vessel. When it was a little cool, there was put therein three pecks of malt, which was left standing for an hour and a half, and then it ought to be drawn off into a cooler. When it was near cold, it was put into a vessel provided for that purpose, perfectly clean, and having a cover to stop it down close. Being therein, it was closely covered down, that it might there stand to sharpen. If the weather should be cold, it might require about eighteen hours, but if it was hot, not quite so long. When it was ripe enough, upon the sudden opening of the vessel, the strength of the fume arising from the liquor would near, if not entirely, extinguish a lighted candle, which ought to be provided short on purpose, and holden over for the proof thereof. When the brewer was satisfied that the grout was properly ripened, he poured it forth into the copper, and boiled it moderately upon a slow fire for about an hour, constantly stirring it all the while, and to know when it was boiled enough, he provided a small ashen stick, which being alighted at the fire, he thrust suddenly into the boiling liquor, drawing it forth as quickly as possible, when, if the fire on the stick remained still unextinguished, it was well boiled, 
but not if it were otherwise. This being done, the liquor was put into a vessel of twenty gallons or thereabouts, and yeast put to it, that it might work, which, when it had sufficiently done, it was ready for the wort to be put to it. The wort might be brewed of what strength the brewer should please, so that it did not exceed sixty gallons to the above proportion of grout. The grout being now properly ripe, and having worked enough, a quantity of the wort, sufficient to fill up the twenty-gallon vessel into which the grout is put, must be poured upon it, and then the whole drawn off into the yielding fat. Note, F-A-T-T, and there, being mixed with the remainder of the wort, is left to work together, which, when it hath sufficiently done, it must be strained off into the hog's head, through a hair sieve made for that purpose, where it must also work like other beer or ale. End of quote. In the ninth year of Edward the Second, things being very scarce, a gallon of ale was sold for tuppence, of the better sort for threepence, and of the best for fourpence. But the Londoners ordained that in the city a gallon of the bettermost sort of ale should be sold for three halfpence, and of the small ale for one penny only. Hollinshead says that every kind of wine could be procured in England. Nevertheless, he adds, ale and beer bear the greatest brunt in drinking, which are of so many sorts and ages as it pleaseth the brewer to make them. The beer that is used at noblemen's tables is commonly of a year old, or peradventure of two years tunning, or more, but this is not general. It is also brewed in March, and is therefore called March beer, but for the household it is usually not under a month's age, each one coveting to have the same, stale as he might, so that was not sour, and the bread new as possible, so that be not hot. End quote. Formerly they drank beer in some parts of France, in others wine. Perhaps it is the same now. This difference of taste gave rise to the rather jocose dispute between a grey friar and a white friar. One who was a Fleming was for beer, the other who was from Bordeaux was for wine. The Fleming cited passages without number from antiquity in proof of the excellence of beer, known by the ancients under the name of Zytham or Curmi. The one from Bordeaux was not so learned, but he was a native of Bordeaux, and with one word he terminated the dispute. Brother, said he to his adversary, I maintain that there is as much difference between wine and beer as there is between St. Francis and St. Dominic. The whole community were for the Bordeaux monk, and the Fleming was reduced to silence. Bracket was formerly the cherished drink of the lower classes in England. Arnold describes the preparation of it in his Chronicles of London. Quote, Take a pot of good ale, and pour thereto a portion of honey and pepper, in this manner. When thou hast good ale, let it stand in a pot two days, and then draw out a quart or a pottle of that ale, and put to the honey, and set it over the fire, and let it set well, and take it off the fire, and scum it clean and then set it over the fire, and scum it again, and then let it keel a while, and put thereto the pepper, and then set him on the fire, and let him boil well together, with easy fire but clear. Take four gallons of good ale, a pint of fine tried honey, and about a saucerful of powder of pepper. End of quote. Beer was not unknown in Italy, but the Romans never granted it their serious attention. We will give a brief sketch of those beverages which, among them and the Greeks, replaced wine with greater or less advantage. Convalescents, sober persons who resisted the sweet seductions of Falernian and Chios wines, drank a kind of barley water, pizzana, a sorry liquid of which the following is the recipe for the use of the abstemious of the present day. They placed barley in water and left it there until it swelled. It was then dried in the sun, then beaten to deprive it of its husk, and ground. Then, when it had been boiled in water for a long time, it was again exposed to the sun. When they wished to drink barley water, a small quantity of this flour was boiled, 
the water was strained off, and a few drops of vinegar were added. The disciples of Comus have always shuddered at this beverage when only mentioned. The Oxycratus was not much better. It was a mixture of water and vinegar, with which the lower orders contented themselves when they could obtain nothing more exhilarating to drink, and with which the soldiers, especially in the camp, were compelled to quench their thirst. Some passages from Pliny, and also from other authors, prove that the ancients were acquainted with cider. It is, however, asserted that the use of this beverage goes no farther back than three or four centuries, either in England or France. But this cannot be a fact with regard to the last-named country, since the capitulars of Charlemagne place among the number of ordinary trades that of sicurator or cider-maker. This wine of apples, it is said, was very common among the Hebrews. That is possible, but it would nevertheless be difficult to prove it from the holy writings, since the word shekar, which has been translated by sicara, and which again has been rendered into cider, signifies all kinds of intoxicating beverage, whether made from grain, honey, or fruit. Gaul, covered with forests, and swarming with bees, possessed an immense quantity of wild honey, of which, by the aid of fermentation in water, the inhabitants composed a strong and intoxicating drink called hydromel. This beverage, highly esteemed both in Rome and Greece, was prepared in the following manner. Rainwater was kept some time, and then boiled, until reduced to a third, to which honey was added. This mixture was exposed to the sun for the space of forty days. It was then placed in a vessel, and by these means they obtained in time a vinous hydromel, very similar to our Madeira wine. To make oxymel, still more heady, ten pounds of honey were mixed with two pints and a half of old vinegar, and one pound of sea salt, the whole boiled only an instant in five pints of water. This liquor was left to get very old. Juice of quinces and honey boiled in water, produced hydromelon, a delicious drink which our century might envy the delicate drinkers of Athens and Rome, especially when roses had been added to this nectar, which changed it into hydrorosatum. The apomeli was nothing more than water in which honeycomb had been boiled. Omphacomeli, an ingenious mixture of honey and verjuice, quenched thirst during the summer, and produced that agreeable gaiety which is to drunkenness what doziness is to sleep. A mixture of honey and juice of myrtle seed, of course diluted with water, composed myrtitus, the aromatic flavour of which flattered the palate and rendered the breath more sweet. Sometimes pomegranates were substituted for the myrtle, and it was then called ruites, and possessed an agreeable and pungent flavour. Wine made of dates enjoyed a general esteem in the East. The Romans, who knew also how to appreciate it, prepared it by throwing into water some common, though very ripe, dates, and when they had well soaked, they were put under a press. The same means were employed to procure fig wine, but often the sediment of grapes was used instead of water, to prevent its being too sweet. Artificial wines were also procured by the aid of several other kinds of fruits, such as sorbs, medlars, and mulberries. Fermentation dispelled the sweet and insipid flavour which generally distinguishes these fruits, and at the commencement of a repast the guests swallowed with delight large cups of these beverages. It was also the custom to serve very cold water, in which certain plants had been infused, and which was freshened by being surrounded with snow after it had been boiled for some time. The invention of this iced water is attributed to the Emperor Nero, who made great use of it, and who appears to have bitterly regretted it when, dethroned and flying from his assassins, he was constrained through excessive thirst to drink muddy water from a ditch. The unfortunate Caesar then, for the first time, thought of the strange vicissitudes of fortune, and casting a sorrowful glance at the disgusting fluid he held in his hand, alas, he exclaimed with a sigh, 
Is this the iced water that Nero drank? T. This plant is a native of China, and it is only in the Celestial Empire that tea is cultivated to any great extent. Why, then, is it neglected on all other points of the globe, situated in the same latitude? Doubtless because the soil of China is superior for its culture to that of any other country. The shrub that produces tea is cultivated between the 23rd and 33rd degrees of latitude. It thrives on the mountainous parts, on the slope of the hills, and that which grows on high ground is far superior to that gathered in the valleys. It is the same with this plant as with the vine in France and in Europe. It grows on flat land, and succeeds wonderfully on plains exposed to the sun's rays. The Chinese export teas of the first quality in much greater proportion than those of an inferior kind. In England there is a larger consumption than in any other country in the world. In China, the tea that forms the habitual beverage of the people is a very inferior species of the bu tree. The provinces of Qiangnang, Qiangsi, and Chukyang furnish green tea to Russia, the United States, Calcutta, and various European countries. The province of Fokien furnishes black tea to England, with the exception of a third of the bu tree, or bohi, which is exported from a district called Wuping, lying to the northwest of the province of Canton. It is in Fokien that the cultivation of this precious shrub is held in the highest estimation. In this province it is deprived of a large number of its buds at the beginning of the spring. Of these are made the tea pico, the most renowned of all kinds. Congo tea serves to perfume part of these buds, and to impart to them a more agreeable flavour. A first gathering of full-grown leaves takes place at the commencement of May, a second towards the middle of June, and a third and last at the end of the summer. This produces a tea inferior to the preceding kinds in point of quality and perfume. The inhabitants of Fokien cultivate tea in enclosures, and at the time of harvest sell the leaves to a class of persons who undertake their preparation, which consists in drying the leaves in houses, first by the simple contact with the air, afterwards in heated warehouses. When the preparation is terminated, the merchants come and make choice of the best qualities. Then the desiccation of the tea is finished, and it is forwarded in packets, each bearing its proper designation. As soon as the leaves have been gathered and selected, they are plunged in boiling water, where they remain about thirty seconds. They are then quickly withdrawn, strained, and thrown on iron plates, large and flat, placed above a furnace. The workmen's hands can hardly endure the heat of these plates. They continually stir the leaves till they are sufficiently heated, after which they take them off, and spread them on large tables covered with mats. Other workmen then busy themselves with rolling them with the palm of the hand, while others cool them as quickly as possible by agitating the air with large fans. This operation must be continued until the leaves have completely cooled under the hand of the person who rolls them, for it is by being quickly cooled that the leaves remain longer curled. Thanks to the operation of rolling them, which is repeated two or three times, the leaves are deprived of their humidity and the unwholesome bitter juice they contain. For teas of the first quality, each leaf must be rolled separately, but for more common kinds, several may be rolled at once. Tea thus prepared is dried and put into boxes or cases free from moisture. The Chinese then aromatize it with various odiferous plants, such as the flowers of the oleo fragrance, or those of the camellia sisangua, shrubs of the same family as tea or those of the scented tea roses and orange flowers. This tea is destined for mandarins of the higher class, for the kalaus, or ministers, or even for the celestial sovereign of the centre of the earth, or in more simple words, the emperor. There are in reality but two kinds of tea, black tea and green tea. Each kind is again subdivided into many varieties. The best black tea is the scented liangxing, 
worth in China about ten shillings the pound. The first of all green teas, destined for the great and bearing an exquisite perfume, is that called Kulang Fini. Monsieur de Rienze assures us that he has seen it sold in Canton for thirty-two shillings a pound. New tea is considered by the Chinese as a powerful narcotic, therefore it is never sold until a year after the gathering. The Europeans and Americans who trade with tea in Canton have recourse for their transactions with the Chinese to native tasters, or others who know how to distinguish the different qualities at the sight of the colour produced by the infusion. It is generally believed in Europe that tea exported thence has already served as a beverage to the Chinese. It is a mistake, propagated by persons who, having seen the tea put in water, have doubtless not well understood the reason of this operation. We must, however, admit that the merchants sometimes mix tea already used with tea of good quality, a fraud only to be discovered by the weakness of the infusion. Tea seems likely to spread over the world. Our books, wines, brandy, cutlery and jewellery go round the globe and are sought after by the civilised nations as well as the wild tribes. On the other hand, we receive our food, together with spices, from Malaysia. We sweeten them with sugar from the Antilles or Siam. We enjoy the flavour and perfume of coffee from Arabia and the island of Bourbon. We intoxicate ourselves with tobacco from Manila, Virginia, of Havana and Latakia, and we imbibe with luxurious pleasure the tea of those Chinese we are continually laughing at, but of whom we have borrowed so many useful things. We must, however, acknowledge that France is the country the least advanced in this respect, and the use of this beneficent drink is far from being as common as it ought to be. We do not fear to say that when once acquainted with the method of preparing it better than is generally done, this inferiority in the consumption will disappear. Some witty delineator of manners and customs has portrayed upon the joyous scene of a comic theatre of Paris that famous tea-party of Mother Gibou and Madame Pochet, one of those ridiculous Parisian and really home scenes, much more common than is generally supposed. And although the picture is overcharged, it is nevertheless true. It is not necessary here to give our private recipe to prepare an infusion in which that excellent lady, Madame Pochet, thought herself so perfect. Suffice to say that to make it agreeable to her guests, she added salt, pepper, some cinnamon, the yolk of an egg, and a tiny drop of vinegar. We would beg the reader not to fail in attending these charming and daily meetings at which each housewife presides, and we would say to strangers, let us seriously study an English tea. Quote, the use of tea in China dates from the greatest antiquity. The Japanese attribute to it a miraculous origin. They say that Dharma, a very pious prince, and son of an Indian king, landed in China in the year 510 of the Christian era, and wishing to edify mankind by his example, imposed upon himself privations of all kinds. It happened, however, that after several years of great fatigue, in spite of his care, he fell asleep, and believing he had violated his oath, and in order to fulfil it faithfully for the future, he cut off his eyelids and threw them on the ground. The next day, returning towards the same spot, he found them changed into a little shrub, hitherto unknown to the earth. He ate some of the leaves, which made him merry, and restored his former strength. Having recommended the same food to his disciples, the reputation of tea soon spread, and has continued in use since that time. End quote. De Fontaine, see also Kemper in his Amenité Exotique. We are ignorant of the period and motives which persuaded the Chinese to use tea in infusion. Perhaps it was to render water more agreeable, which is said to be brackish and of a bad taste in many parts of China. In 1641, Tulpius, a Dutch physician, was the first to mention this plant, in a dissertation he published. In 1657, Jonquet, a French physician, called it the divine plant, and compared it to ambrosia. 
in 1679, Cornelius Bentico, a Dutch physician, published a treatise in which he declared himself a partisan of tea, and asserted that this beverage in no way could injure the stomach, even if drunk to the extent of two hundred cups a day. Many of his countrymen went even beyond this. They made of it a universal panacea. As at first the leaves of the tea plant were rare and but little known, many persons thought they had discovered in Europe what others fetched from such a distance. Thus Simon Pauli introduced the royal pimento, Maria Galli, of Lynn, as the real tea of China. Others thought to have found the marvellous virtues of tea in plants growing in our own country, such as marjoram, veronica, myrtle, sage, agrimony, and so on. But it happily ended in granting the preference to the real tea of China and Japan. Coffee In the trade, five principal kinds of coffee are enumerated, or rather five sorts, according to the different countries from whence they come, although all derived from the same kind of coffee tree, coffea arabica. These five kinds are as follows. First, mocha coffee, thus called from the country whence this kind of coffee originates, a plant now so commonly spread over every American colony. The grain of this coffee is generally round and small. From mocha coffee is derived the most sweet and agreeable beverage. It is also the most esteemed, the dearest, and holds the first rank in the trade. Second, the bourbon coffee, cultivated in the island of Bourbon. For some time it occupied the second place in quality, but the gourmets prefer to it coffee from Martinique or Guadeloupe. Third, there are several kinds of Martinique or Guadeloupe, distinguished by the various preparations. Fourth, the cayenne coffee. This kind is less known on account of the small quantity cultivated there, and introduced in trade. This kind is superior to the Martinique coffee. Fifth, the San Domingo coffee, in which is comprised that from Puerto Rico and other leeward islands, is considered inferior to the four other kinds. Let us mention a few of the methods by which coffee in infusion is obtained. It is not exactly known who introduced the custom of taking coffee. Some attribute its use to the prior of a convent, who, becoming acquainted with the properties of this plant by the effect it produced on the goats which fed upon it, tried its influence on his monks in order to keep them awake during the performance of divine service. According to others, the discovery is due to a mufti, who, wishing to surpass in devotion the most religious dervishes, made use of coffee so as to banish sleep and thus be enabled to pray longer without interruption. Whatever may be the origin of the use of coffee, it has become so general up to the present day that it may almost be classed among the articles of the greatest necessity. This extensive use has stimulated the industry of inventors to seek means of rendering it most pleasant to drink, as also its great consumption and high price have awaked both economy and fraud, in order to find a substitute for this agreeable beverage. It would be useless here to describe the different methods of making coffee. It will be sufficient to mention that all those which tend to prepare it without boiling the water in which the pulverised coffee is placed are almost equally good. In order to supplant coffee, which in Europe was found very expensive, many different means have been tried. About fifty years since the Swiss porter of a nobleman in Paris thought of roasting acorns, which he mixed with roast coffee ground, he sold it cheaper than any one. All bought it, and the Swiss made his fortune. The trick, however, being discovered, all sought means of gratifying their taste without emptying their purses. Barley and rye began to be mixed with coffee. In the mountains of Virginia and America, the inhabitants make a coffee simply of roasted rye. They by these means obtain a beverage in no way resembling coffee. But it goes by that name, and at least the imagination is satisfied. In Belgium, in the province of Liege, 
coffee is mixed with wild chicory root. This method, generally known, is at the present time practised throughout the whole of Europe, and wild chicory root then opened for liege a new branch of commerce. Lastly, in Flanders, some of the inhabitants cultivate the lupin, which they complacently call coffee, and whose seed roasted they drink instead of real coffee. Quote, the infusion of coffee is thought to be beneficial to stout and phlegmatic persons, and for pains in the head, but it appears that its admixture with cream or milk prevents these good effects, on account of the relaxation it thus causes to the stomach. On the contrary, it gives strength when taken pure. It is doubtless for this reason that the inhabitants of the colonies take it three and four times a day, that is, at four o'clock in the morning, a very strong infusion, sometimes without sugar, at breakfast with milk, after dinner pure, and often in the afternoon for the fourth time. End quote by Beauvais. We are unacquainted with the period of the introduction of coffee into Europe. Ralwolf is the first who speaks of coffee, in 1588. Prospero Alpini then came, and described the coffee tree in Egypt by the name of Bon, Bun, or Boon. His work appeared in 1591. In 1614, Bacon mentioned this oriental beverage, and Meissner published a treatise on it in 1621. It was not, however, until towards the year 1645 that it began to be drunk in Italy. The first cafés were opened in London in 1652 and in Paris in 1669, a time at which a pound of coffee was worth 40 crowns. It was principally Solomon Aga, the ambassador from Turkey, who caused coffee to become fashionable in Paris. It penetrated into Sweden in the year 1674, where it was thought of use in scorbutic diseases. The first person who made trial of coffee with milk was Newhoff, the Dutch ambassador in China, in imitation of tea with milk. Quote, the physical effects of coffee are well known. It accelerates the circulation of the blood, but sometimes causes palpitation of the heart and giddiness. It has even been thought to occasion apoplexy and paralysis. Nevertheless, celebrated writers, such as Fontenelle and Voltaire, made constant use of it, almost to an abuse. They were told, it is a slow poison. It was indeed slow for these learned men, who died, the one at a hundred, the other eighty-four years of age. However, at the present time, coffee is a beverage whose power over our intellectual or moral habits has perhaps never been calculated as it deserves, since it has become general and almost suppressed the drunkenness which disgraced our ancestors at the end of their great repasts. End quote by Viri. The subject we have just slightly touched upon recalls to our recollection a whim of the charming Sevigny, Le Café et Racine Passion, said this amiable lady, nearly two hundred years ago. The beautiful marchioness was mistaken. Both coffee and Racine have remained, and do not appear likely soon to bid us adieu. Chocolate. Every one is aware that chocolate is an aliment obtained from the cocoa nut, roasted and reduced to paste, with sugar and aromatics. But first, the choice of cocoa nuts is not indifferent. Those from Soconosco, from Caracas, and Maracaibo are the best and sweetest. It is, however, well to mix with them other kinds, to correct their insipidity by a certain sharpness far from being unpleasant. Thus, to four parts of Caracas cocoa, earthed, that is, rendered mild by a sojourn of some weeks under the moist earth, a part of cocoa from the Antilles, or Marignan and Para, is added. This kind contains more of sharp and bitter matter. These cocos are slightly torrified in an iron pan. The Spaniards burn their cocoa much less than the Italians. Being left to grow cold, this cocoa is slightly crushed to separate the envelopes or shells which are thrown away. However, in England, Switzerland and Germany, these shells serve to make, with boiling water, a warm infusion, mixed with milk, 
and drank in lieu of real chocolate. The envelopes of torrefied coffee are employed in a similar manner in the East for the Sultana coffee. The mixtures of torrefied cocoa are reduced into a fat paste of a brown colour, either between stones or by means of an iron roller upon a porphyry rock, warmed underneath by live coals. This paste, regularly ground, is at last incorporated with sugar equal to its weight. Then it is mixed together as perfectly as possible. In this chocolat de santé, a small quantity of very fine cinnamon powder is admitted, which makes it more palatable and neutralizes the action of the fat and heavy substance, or vegetable butter, contained in the cocoa. Quote, the term chocolate belongs, it is said, to the language of the Mexicans, and is derived from the two words choco, sound or noise, and atle, water, because it is beaten in boiling water to make it froth, according to the custom of this people. Before their conquest by the Spaniards, it formed the principal element of the Mexicans. They held the cocoa tree in such estimation that its kernel served as current coin, and this custom even now remains. End quote by Humboldt. The Mexican chocolate, besides the pimento, contained the chili, or Indian wheat flour, with honey or sweet juice of the agava. To this was added anotto, an astringent tinctorial juice of a rosy hue, obtained from the seeds of the bixa or liana. The chieftains, or lords and warriors only, enjoyed the right of feeding on chocolate, as the most restoring element, and the most capable, in their opinion, of repairing worn-out strength and producing vigour. The addition of the perfume of vanilla, again, augments this quality, according to the testimony of physicians and travellers. Diaz of Castillo relates that Montezuma drank vanilla chocolate, and the Maréchal de Belleisle says, in his testament politique, that the regent, Louis-Philippe d'Orléans, regaled himself every morning with chocolate at his petit lever. The ladies of Chiapa, in Mexico, are so fond of these perfumed chocolates that they even have them carried to eat in church. The Spanish Creole nuns have also brought to great perfection the art of preparing fine chocolate, perfumed with amber. The use of chocolate was soon brought from Mexico, after its conquest by Fernando Cortes, into Spain, and this food has there become quite habitual. First, it easily deceives hunger by reason of its oily qualities and slow digestion. Then it is softening and cooling, which renders it particularly desirable in warm climates, especially such as the Iberian Peninsula. Thus the Spaniards but slightly roast their coconuts. They prefer preserving but a very slight bitterness, and mixing with it more aromatics. Besides, chocolate so useful to dry and nervous temperaments is an agreeable analeptic, recommended against hypochondria and melancholy, two affections so common to the Spaniards. The beggars, even, could not live without it, and they accost each other in the morning with inquiring if their lordships have taken their chocolate. This element is favourable to idleness, augments the calm of the body and mind, and plunges one in a sweet quietude of far niente, at a small expense. From Spain, the fashion of taking chocolate was introduced into Italy, especially by the Florentine Antonio Carletti. The Italians extract from cocoa more exalted qualities by torrefication. They burn it till it becomes bitter. The grave question arose among them whether chocolate taken in the morning by the monks broke the fast principally in Lent. The Cardinal Brancaccio and other learned casuists battled long in order to prove that chocolate, being evidently a beverage made of water, could not be in the least considered as an aliment, nor break the fast. We see, indeed, in the correspondence of the Princesse de Zarsin, all-powerful at the court of Philip V of Spain, and Madame de Montenon, that the consciences of pious persons 
had been placed in full tranquillity by this decision and that any one might fast during the whole lent as perfectly by drinking chocolate as if he had only partaken of a glass of cold water Quote, chocolate became pretty common in france from the time of anne of austria mother of louis the fourteenth however it does not appear to have ever excited the same enthusiasm as coffee it is not favourable to good cheer nor is it exhilarating to this may be traced perhaps the indifference of the english for this beverage End quote. Vire. in trade as we have said are distinguished a great variety of cocos and they are all called by the name of the country whence they come thus we have the caracas cocoa the surinam cocoa and so on that which comes from the french possessions is called also cocoa of the isles the caracas is the most esteemed of all it is more oily than the other kinds and has no sharpness of flavour it is known by being larger rough of an ovoid oblong shape not flattened covered with a greyish dust and by the kernel being easily divided into several irregular fragments Quote, the name of cacao of which in french has been made the word cacaoyer is that given by the inhabitants of guyana to this grain as to the scientific name theobrama linnaeus formed it from two greek words signifying food of the gods End quote. by de Mezel. End of section 28section twenty nine of pantrophion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c pantrophion by alexis soyer drinking cups if men were wiser the nineteenth century would probably not have seen a beneficent apostle preaching temperance everywhere and making his name cherished and celebrated by a series of successes which could hardly have been expected numerous societies of hydropotes or teetotalers would not alarm in our days those joyful disciples of bacchus temple hydrophobes by profession by taste and interest who sincerely bewail the desertion of newly made abstemious members and no person would promise by a solemn and formidable pledge to forego the drinking of anything but water the abuse must have been very great since it was necessary to have recourse to such a remedy it is true that the evil had taken deep root and that the most ancient people the gods and the heroes have left us examples of the dangerous seduction the synthinians the celts iberians and thracinians were confirmed drunkards the wise nestor himself who was so good a match for agamemnon often felt some difficulty in finding his tent alexander the great slept some time two days and two nights after having paid too much devotion to the god of good cheer and philip his father very frequently left the table with a very heavy head and staggering legs it is reported that dionysus the younger tyrant of sicily lost his sight through drinking too much which will not be wondered at if what is supposed be true that this miserable man was drunk every day without fail for three months together shall we mention tiberius surnamed by the army biberius tippler who after he became emperor passed the days and nights drinking with flaccus and piso at the very time they were working at the reformation of the romans this pagan solomon 
having to choose from among several very distinguished candidates who offered themselves for quaitorship preferred the least known because he had drunk a whole pitcher of wine which the prince himself had condescended to fill intoxication with the greeks was noted as belonging to low company if we are to judge by certain personages whom asius and sophiles did not fear to bring on the stage and who struck each other with vases a thing which the modern theatre had judiciously banished homer is more reserved for achilles after copious libations only threw a neat foot at ulysses head which probably was not of much consequence the fact is that the ancients did not at all profess the same principles that we do respecting intemperance hippocrates himself advised men to seek mirth now and then in wine seneca recommends us to drown cares and fatigue in it and musius decorates with crowns of flowers the foreheads of the sages who sitting by the side of plato at all new banquets should find in continual drunkenness the sweetest reward for their virtues a singular bliss which only reason in delirium could have imagined we have spoken of the delicious beverage which was so costly a seduction to choice epicureans who took merit to themselves for not resisting it for this reason it was necessary to invent vessels worthy of containing it and art encouraged by luxury produced those magnificent vases of which ostentatious antiquity had only left us a faint idea the cups of the homeric times were all equal capacity one of them was offered to each guest but several were offered to persons of high distinction the greeks thought much of their cups for them they were sacred relics from father to son and were only used on certain solemnities thus epidius delivers the most frightful imprecation against his son polynetics who had presented at a common repast the cup of his ancestors that of nestor was so large that a young man could hardly carry it as to him he lifted it up without the slightest difficulty the athenians drank from cups in the shape of horns wax vases were sufficient for the spaniards the gaul who had thrown down an urus wild ox took his horns decorated them with silver and gold rings and made his guests drink out of them often the skull of an enemy killed in single combat was transformed into a cup of honor and reminded a gallic family of the memorable action of a valiant ancestor the first cups of the romans were made of horns or of an earthenware of samos those conquerors of the world had not yet enervated their manly courage with the luxurious spoils of conquered nations afterwards some very simple ones were made of beech wood or elder these possessed a marvellous property which they ought to have always preserved the wine only escaped from them and they retained the water which had been mixed with it but rome always tired of its austere simplicity and its disdain for the greek cups of glass and crystal soon began to desire something finer those magnificent chalices masterpieces of patience and skill in which gold and silver were amalgamated with a more brittle material were soon in much request and appeared worthy of their renown but it is to be observed that the crystal of which the most precious cups were made had not the slightest similarity to that which we make use of now and which the least shock will break it was flexible and malleable 
it might be thrown on the pavement with impunity and remained unhurt here is on this subject a curious anecdote which has been left to us by petronius a certain skilled workman used to make crystal vases as strong as vases of gold and silver he produced an incomparable masterpiece it was a chalice of astonishing beauty which he thought worthy of caesar only and which he felt a pride in offering to him tiberius highly praised the skill and the rich present of the artist this man wishing to increase still more the admiration of the prince and secure his favours to a greater degree begged of him to give back the vase he then threw it with all his might on the marble pavement of the apartment the hardest metal could never have resisted this terrible shock caesar appeared moved and was silent the artist with a triumphant smile picked up the vase which had only a slight dent and which by striking it with the hammer soon brought to its original state this being done no doubt remained on his mind that he had conquered the good graces of the emperor and the esteem of an astonished court tiberius asked him if he was the only one who knew how to work crystal in so remarkable a manner the workman immediately answered that no one possessed his secret very well said caesar let his head be struck off without loss of time for if this strange invention were known gold and silver would very soon have not the least value thus did the emperor tiberius encourage artists and the arts there were besides cups made of the most pure crystal the brittleness of which seems to have added to their price and which were paid for dearer than gold and precious stones but much less however than those famous murrhine vases which have so long exercised the useless sagacity of ancient commentators among the rich spoils that pompey conqueror of mithridates and master of part of asia ostensibly displayed in his triumph the romans for the first time admired vases and cups the material and workmanship of which surpassed all that the imagination could fancy the most graceful and delicate they were much in request the price was exorbitant and thenceforth they were indispensable one of the ancient consuls thought himself too happy to give only a little more than six thousand pounds for one of those marines such was the name given to the brittle and rare novelty petronius paid for a large basin twenty eight thousand pounds and nero spent the like sum for a vase with two handles which he forgot two days afterwards the marine cups appeared on the table with the wine of the hundred leaves and the falerian was poured into them so as to preserve all the generous delicacy of its odour the marines were much sought after on account of their form and brilliant transparency they were made of mother of pearl according to bellon but others say of agate their dimensions however would incline one to doubt it saliger cardin and madame dacier thought that the ancients gave unheard-of prices for simple porcelain vases which were precious on account of their rarity this opinion which several modern literati have adopted rests plausibly enough it appears on one verse of Peritus, in which this poet speaks of marine cups baked in the furnace of the parthenians it has been said that perhaps the parthenians learnt from the chinese how to make porcelain 
but this supposition entirely void of proof has been contradicted in a most peremptory manner by the author of a very curious book who demonstrates irrefragably that the marines were not of porcelain but of stones of the species of onyx the following fact will leave but very little doubt on that subject in seventeen ninety one the constituent national assembly appointed a commission to make an inventory and valuation of all objects in the guard mabel of the crown they found among other very beautiful sardonyx two very antique vases one made in the form of an ewer ten inches in height and four inches in diameter having its handle cut out of the same piece and the second hollowed out as a bowl ten inches in diameter which was recognized as real marines beautiful white and blue veins and other shades circulated about the bowl without interfering with its semi-transparency the bottom was of the same color as the ewer the jewelers estimated these vases at six thousand pounds each although there was nothing engraved in the hollow nor in relief but merely on consideration of the beauty of the material the fineness of the polish and the difficulty that must have attended the hollowing out of the ewer these valuations would appear exaggerated if it were not known that the antique vase of the duke of brunswick which formerly belonged to the dukes of mantua in sixteen thirty one and made of sardonyx in the cruet shape was valued at a hundred and fifty thousand german crowns or dollars of three shillings four pennies the relief engraving represented the mysteries of Suries and bacchus but it had no primitive handle and the diameter was only two inches and a half by the side of these inestimable marines was were standing very graceful chalices of amber the prodigious workmanship of which absolutely gave to them a most arbitrary value but which romans prodigally never found too high silver cups engraved were also nearly as much esteemed when they came from the hands of some well-known workmen such as myos mentor or myron they were even preferred to gold cups unless these latter were enriched with precious stones all these vases presented still greater varieties in their forms than in the materials employed there were very large ones some narrow some oblong many ornamented with two handles others had only one some were much like tympanon or zof a musical instrument of the ancient hebrews a small boat or ewer in one word the greek or roman artist never listened to anything but his own fancy and was then far from supposing that he was preparing very long and wakeful hours of study to many aquarians zealous to explain seriously the strange wanderings of a fantastical imagination end of section twenty nine recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section thirty of Pantrophion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Pantrophion by Alexis Soyer. Section thirty. Wine. Bacchus, son of Ammon, was born in Egypt and was the first who taught his countrymen the act of cultivating the vine and of making wine he is the same as osiris the famous conqueror of india should this assertion be contradicted we shall only entreat any and every disputant to make his own choice of the god of vineyards 
from among the five heroes bearing the name of Bacchus, as we are too impartial to prefer any one in particular. Onopion, worthy son of one of these heroes, enriched the inhabitants of Chios with the first rosy wine that ever yet obscured their reason. Greece, Italy, and Sicily owed this wonderful liquor to the Egyptians. The Gauls received this sweet present from a Tuscan, who had been banished from Clusium, his country. And the cultivation of the grape spread rapidly till the reign of the sanguinary Domitian, who completed the catalogue of his crimes by tearing up the vines. The emperor Probos restored them to the disconsolate Gauls. That prince was certainly worthy of his name. Modern science, agreeing with Holy Writ, in Genesis 9, verse 20, looks upon the East as the common cradle of the vine and the human race. Palestine was renowned for its vines. Pliny speaks in praise of them. The vineyards constituted a part of the riches of the country, and they were preserved with the greatest care, so much so that Moses, with an especial view to vines, forbade the sowing of different seeds in the same field, on pain of confiscation. And it was done to encourage their cultivation, that that wise legislator exempted every person who had planted one from military service, and from all public duties, until the first vintage. Genesis chapter 22, verse 6. The growths of Lebanon, of Helbon, and of Sorek enjoyed an extraordinary reputation, and the delicious wine they produced was capable of inspiring the lyric David with that celebrated praise, by which intemperance has often dared to authorise reprehensible excesses. Psalm 103, verse 15. However, the Hebrews, a sober people, like all Eastern nations, rarely made use of pure wine. They generally mixed it with a quantity of water, and only drank a little at some ceremonial feasts, and at the end of their repasts. They sometimes mixed it with perfumes and odoriferous drugs. Some nations seem to have had a great horror of wine. The Persians drank nothing but water, and the inhabitants of Pontus, the Scythians, and the Cappadocians partook of this strange taste. The Arcadians, who lived on chestnuts and acorns, were not worthy of the favours of Bacchus. Neither were the troglodytes, ichthyophagists, and other swarms of hydropotes, who were as yet too little civilised to ask of drunkenness its illusions and its enchantments. The Egyptians would have thought it a profanation of their temples to carry in a flagon of the rosy liquid. But Sameticus came, 670 BC, and that wise prince made them understand that a pot of beer is not worth a cup of good wine. The Romans asserted that their old king, Janus, planted the first vine in Italy, and that later Numa taught them how to trim it. That noble people knew how to appreciate such blessings, and in order to demonstrate that wisdom is always to be found in wine, they never failed to place on their altars the statue of Minerva beside that of Bacchus. The inflexible muse of history has preserved to us the name of the individual who doomed himself to a sorry sort of immortality by inventing the custom of mixing water with wine. It was Cranaus, king of Athens, 1532 BC. The gods, doubtless to punish him, caused a great part of Greece to be inundated and it was not long before he was dethroned. Pliny accuses the obscure Staphyl, son of Scython, of this deprivation of taste, which gained upon imitators to such an extent that, in the time of Deodorus of Sicily, 45 BC, the guests still mixed water with their wine at the end of the repast. It is true that they were then all intoxicated. Lycurgus, was no doubt ignorant of this practice when he had the barbarity to destroy the vines of the Lacedaemonians under pretext of putting an end to the disorders caused by intemperance. It would have been preferable, says Plutarch, to have united the nymphs with Bacchus. 
the ingenious philosopher insists on the mixture being made by a fourth a fifth or an octave in the same manner as the chords in music which charm our ears the fifth was obtained by pouring three measures of water on two of wine one part water and two parts wine made the octave a quarter of wine and three quarters of water produced the fourth a most inharmonious chord struck only by inexperienced and unskilful hands hippocrates great physician as he was had already somewhere advised this deplorable dereliction from all wise doctrines so true is it that science sometimes goes astray but happily for his glory that learned man further on recommends us to drink pure wine and to drink enough for joy to dissipate our griefs and rock us in the sweet errors of hope the god of grapes had everywhere fervent admirers except perhaps among the scythians these schismatics refused to worship a divinity who caused the faithful to become intoxicated in other places they sacrificed to him a tiger in order to show the power of his empire and zealous disciples with their heads crowned with branches of the vine holding in one hand a crater and in the other a torch ran with dishevelled hair about the streets shouting to the son of jupiter the terrible evius in the silence of the night the romans addressed to him special prayers twice a year on the occasion of the wine festivals which took place in the months of may and september in the first they tasted the wine and during the second they implored the god to grant italy fine weather and abundant vintages the god could not reasonably refuse this request for the vine dressers spared neither labour nor fatigue to procure an abundant harvest they were constantly seen disencumbering the plant of a too luxurious foliage thereby exposing the grapes to the sun's rays which bring them to maturity and breaking with indefatigable perseverance the least clods of earth which accumulating around the tendrils appeared to fatigue them by their weight and woe to the thief whom they detected by night stealing any of these carefully reared grapes his crime was punished with death unless the inexperience of youth pleaded in his favour in that case a severe flagellation impressed on him permanently the remembrance of his fault and of the rights of property the imperial jurisprudence afterwards softened the draconian rigour of this law of the decemviri the ancients like ourselves were fond of seeing fresh grapes appear on their tables at all periods of the year they preserved them by covering them with barley flour or by placing fine bunches in rain-water diminished to a third by boiling the vase was hermetically sealed with pitch and plaster and then placed in a spot where the sun's rays could not enter this water was an excellent beverage for the sick the method of making wine was precisely the same both in greece and italy the vine gatherers carefully rejected the green grapes and piled the others in deep baskets the contents of which were instantly emptied into large vats there men hardly clothed in the lightest garments trampled them under their feet whilst joyous songs and sounds of flutes hastened their movements and animated them to work faster wine obtained in this manner was much esteemed and kept very well the wort which escaped from the vat as soon as they had thrown in the grapes and which came from the pressure occasioned by their laying one on the other enjoyed the preference this first liquor was transformed into an exquisite wine the grapes crushed by the feet were placed under the press and an opening made in the lower part of the vat allowed the wort to flow into earthen jars whence it was subsequently poured into the barrels the press was always raised at a little distance from the cellar and kitchen its mechanism was very simple the antiquities of herculaneum will furnish us with an example two trees were firmly fixed in the ground at a few feet distance one from the other and a strong horizontal beam rested on their summit other pieces of wood similar to the top piece were placed underneath 
the grapes occupied the space between the vat and the lower plank. Between each of the cross planks, wedges were introduced, and two persons kept striking them with hammers, one on each side. It is thus the pressure was effected. Wine from the press, inferior to those just mentioned, served for the ordinary consumption of the family, and for the servants. It was not racked, but simply taken from the barrel as it was wanted. The lees were taken from the press when it yielded no more liquor. A certain quantity of water was poured over them, and the whole subjected to a second pressure. The weak kind of wine obtained by this new operation must have somewhat resembled that acrid stuff called piquette in France. It was the beverage of the people, and especially of the country people, during the winter. A part of the wort, that which was required for immediate use, was put aside and clarified with vinegar. A portion of that obtained from the crushed grapes was put to boil on furnaces, supported on three legs, at a little distance from the press, in coppers, the contents of which were continually stirred. This liquor, reduced by a third, was called carinum. When the half only remained, it was called defrutum. And lastly, when the ebullition left only a third part remaining, this substance, very similar to honey, took the name of sapa. It was mixed with flour to flatten the snails reared by skilful speculators who reserved them for the Roman Sybarites. This wort, thus prepared by night when the moon did not shine, and carefully skimmed, served to preserve wines, to give more body to those which were thought too weak, and became the base of several beverages sought in preference by Roman ladies at that period of life when maturity of years made alliance with sensuality. Those who wished to preserve sweet wine during a whole year filled with the second wort, that is to say, that which was produced by the pression of the feet, some amphorae covered with pitch inside and out. They were then hermetically sealed and buried in the sand, or plunged in cold water, where they remained at least two months. There still was left a large quantity of wort as it came from the grapes. This was taken into the cellar, which was always situated a little below the level of the ground, or to the ground floor, where no kind of smell was allowed to penetrate, or any emanation capable of spoiling the bouquet of the wine it contained. Description of Plate Number 22 Number 1. Wine Press, explained in the text. Number 2. A large vase, in which a man is sitting, supposed to be Diogenes. This amphora is broken, and the pieces are joined by ties of lead, cut dovetailed. It is a bas-relief, from the Villa Albani, published by Winkelmann. Number 3 represents a beast of burden, with a pack-saddle loaded with two amphorae. This piece of terracotta, drawn the size of the original, is taken from the collection of children's playthings of Prince de Biscari. The difficulty of carriage was so great in mountainous countries that the inhabitants of the Alps substituted for vessels of terracotta casks or wooden tubs, put together with wooden circles, similar to our own. At Herculaneum a spacious cellar has been discovered, round which hogsheads were ranged and built into the wall. Another cellar at Pompeii, remarkable for its small size, is divided into two compartments, both containing barrels, and divided one from the other by a horizontal wall. Large earthen vessels were found there, with and without handles, very carefully executed, and smeared with pitch. We know that the cynic Diogenes dwelt in one of these vases, and that the king Alexander found him crouching in this strange kind of carapace. The ancients had butts also, but they used them only in cold countries. The dolia, for so they were named, were first subjected to a fumigation with aromatic plants, then watered with sea water, and buried halfway in the earth. They were separated each one from the other, and strict attention was paid to see that the cellar contained neither leather nor cheese, nor figs, nor old casks. Sometimes persons who inhabited the country paved the storeroom, spread sand, and placed the dolia on it. 
at the end of nine days when the fermentation had cleared the wine from those substances it rejects they carefully covered the dolia after having smeared all the upper part of the inside as well as the covers themselves with a mixture of defrutum saffron mastic pitch and pine nuts the butts of aqueous wine were exposed to the north spirituous wines often braved the rain the sun and every change of temperature they accelerated the fining of the wine by throwing in plaster chalk marble dust salt resin dregs of new wine sea-water myrrh and aromatic herbs the butts were uncovered once a month or more frequently in order to refresh the contents and before the head was put on again it was rubbed with pine nuts wine was also clarified by drawing it off into another butt and mixing yolks of egg beaten with salt or straining it through the colum nevarium already described covered with a piece of linen fine wines were kept in the wood for two three or four years according to their different properties after which they were transferred to amphorae and that operation required the greatest care description of plate number twenty three colum nevarium a strainer used to separate the dregs from the wine two are preserved in the collection of herculaneum they are made of white metal and worked with elegance each is composed of two plates round and concave of four inches in diameter supplied with flat handles the two dishes as it were and their handles adapt to each other so well that when put together they appear as one holes in great number are symmetrically perforated in the upper dish which keeps the dregs and lets the clear liquid pass through the lower one the strainer here represented is taken from montfaucon's antiquities and was found at rome towards the end of the seventeenth century it is of bronze and ornamented on the handles are reliefs in silver referring to the worship of bacchus the amphorae were earthen pitchers with two handles reserved for choice wines to prevent evaporation through their pores they covered them with pitch and stopped the neck with wood or cork covered with a mastic composed of pitch chalk and oil or any other fat substance the name of the wine was inscribed on the amphora its age was indicated by the designation of the consuls who were in office when it was made when the amphora was of glass it was ticketed with these details for this kind of vessels they had store-rooms which were commonly at the top of the house by exposing them to the sun and to smoke the maturity of the wine was hastened the discovery of this means of ripening which the roman onophiles never failed to practise was attributed to the consul opimius pliny assures us that the vineyards of the entire world produce a hundred and ninety five different kinds of wine or double that number if we reckon every variety the whole universe says he furnishes only eighty of superior quality and of this number two-thirds belong to italy modern agriculture must have singularly disturbed the calculations of the roman naturalist let that be as it may the best greek wines were those of thassos lesbos chios and cos italy boasted of the centinum the felernum the albanum and the mamertinum after these a number of other excellent wines occupied a very distinguished place in a long nomenclature to be found in pliny and athenius description of plate number twenty four number one amphora or dolium upon one of the handles is engraved the sigil p s a x the first two probably are the initials of the proprietor and the last describes the capacity of the vase being two hundred and fifty quarts montfaucon's antiquities numbers two and three smaller dolium found at herculaneum buried at the bottom of a cellar the mouths of these vases were fixed in a marble slab and closed with a cover of the same material there is in the villa albani an amphora of terracotta of this kind which contained eighteen roman amphorae 
or 463 quarts, as marked by numerical letters engraved upon the outside. In 1750, one of these amphorae was found at Puzzoli, which was five feet six inches in height and five feet in diameter, containing 1,728 quarts. Several amphorae from Herculaneum and Pompeii have inscriptions written in colours and which give the name of the praetor Nonius, the same as those found at Rome, which were inscribed with the name of the consul to fix the year of the vintage. The ancients professed to have a very particular veneration for wines of a renowned growth, which had ripened slowly in amphorae. Some gastronomic archaeologists produced on their tables certain wines which had so far dried up in leather bottles that they were taken out in lumps. Others, placed in the chimney corner, became in time as hard as salt. Petronius speaks of a wine of a hundred leaves. Pliny says that guests were served with wine more than two hundred years old. It was as thick as honey. This wine was thinned with warm water and passed through the straining bag. Socatio vinorum. This predilection for good old wine was common to the Greeks. The Romans, who liked it for the bitterness it had contracted by age, and the Egyptians, who, notwithstanding their time-honoured love of beer, were not unjust towards the beverage with which their Osiris found it so delightful to intoxicate himself. Athenius sets no bounds to his praise of old wine. He says it is excellent for the health. It is the best thing to dissolve the food. It strengthens. It assists the circulation of the blood and assures a peaceful sleep. Who then would be ungrateful enough to refuse to drink? The topers of antiquity did not disdain white wine, but they seem to have viewed it as of secondary importance. It digests easily, says the writer just cited, but it is weak and has but little body. Red wine, on the contrary, is full of strength and energy, and it is the first that the inhabitants of Chios learned to make, when Onopion, the son of Bacchus, had planted the vine in their country. However, there was no lack of amateurs of white wine, and like ourselves, the ancients doubtless preferred it when they eat snails, oysters, or any of those shellfish, with which the Lucrine lake abounded. They even took it into their heads, how ingenious is gluttony, to change red wine sometimes into white. To do this, it was only necessary to put three whites of egg, or some bean flour, into a flagon, and shake it a long time. The same result was obtained with ashes from the white vine. Now, is Apicius jesting with us a little when he gives this recipe? Or was it a legerdemain trick to amuse the guests at the end of a repast, when too frequent libations had rendered them incapable of distinguishing clearly one colour from another? The Greeks endeavoured to preclude the disastrous effects of intoxication by putting sea-water into the wine, a mixture which they also thought had the effect of assisting digestion. One measure of water was enough for fifty measures of wine, and again the merchants of that nation took so much interest in the health of foreign consumers that they never shipped the wines of the archipelago for Rome or elsewhere without diluting them in this manner. Such, for example, was the course followed in concocting that celebrated wine of Chios, which Cato imitated so as to deceive the best judges. That honest geoponic has transmitted us his secret. Fifty-six pints of old sea-water are thrown into a pipe of sweet wine made with grapes dried in the sun, or two-thirds of a bushel of salt are put into a rush basket and suspended in the middle of the pipe, where it is left to melt. This very simple process metamorphoses the most indifferent liquor into that delightful nectar which gave renown and fortune to the Isle of Chios. The saline wine of the Greeks, Vinum Tethalasomenon, was nothing else. Their Thalassitas wine, so much in demand in Italy on account of its apparent age, owed its reputation to the fact of its having been plunged for some time in the sea. 
this little trading knavery was a tolerably innocent means of increasing the profits of the speculator who hastened the maturity of his wines without employing any of those deleterious ingredients which illicit traders have introduced at a later period when the wine had remained a sufficient time in the sea to give it age it was drawn off into goatskin bottles well coated with pitch and in this manner it supported the longest sea voyages the following are the made wines most in vogue in olden times the passum was one of those most esteemed in rome particularly when it came from crete it was made with grapes spread in the sun until they were reduced in weight to one half the pips thus dried were then put into a butt containing some excellent wort when they were well soaked they were crushed with the feet and then subjected to a slight pressure in the wine press sometimes they simply plunged the fresh grapes into boiling oil instead of exposing them to the sun and the result was the same the dulce wine was obtained by drying the grapes in the sun for three days and crushing them with the feet on the fourth at the time of the greatest heat the emperor commodus thought this a most delectable drink the mulsum or honeyed wine was an exquisite mixture of old falernian wine and new honey from the mount himetus the physician Celius aurelianus recommends the holding of warm mulsum in the mouth as a palliative in cases of violent headache the name anisites wine was given to that in which some grains of aniseed had been infused the granatum was prepared by throwing thirty broken pomegranates into a pipe of wine and pouring over them ten pints and a half of a different wine hard and sour this drink was fit for use at the end of thirty days apicius gives us the recipe for the rosatum put says he some rose leaves into a clean linen cloth sew it up and leave it seven days in the wine take out the roses and put in fresh ones repeat the operation three times and then strain the wine add some honey at the time of drinking the roses must be fresh and free from dew the violatum is made in the same manner only violets are used instead of roses rosatum may also be obtained without roses by putting a small basket filled with green lemon leaves into a barrel of new wine before the fermentation has taken place and leaving them there for forty days this wine is to be mixed with honey before it is drunk myrrh wine merinum among the ancients was wine mixed with a little myrrh to render it better and make it keep longer they thought much of it all these wines like those previously mentioned were strained through the column vinarium before they were served to the guests this strainer was composed of two round deep dishes of four inches in diameter the upper part was pierced and received the wine which ran into the lower recipient whence the cups were filled in rome the price of common wine sometimes adulterated was three hundred sesterces for forty urns or fifteen sesterces for an amphora that is to say about sixpence per gallon at athens it was thought dear when it cost fourpence per gallon this measure was commonly sold for not more than twopence in the early days of the roman republic women were forbidden to drink wine but that law fell into disuse and noble matrons often carried intemperance as far as their toping husbands the cure wine it must be owned that the roman law was for a long time tyrannical in the extreme with regard to women totally interdict the use of wine kill the unfortunate creatures who were unable to resist the seductions of that dangerous liquor for the roman history furnishes us with more than one example of that atrocious chastisement inflicted on the guilty thirst of the fair sex the barbarous Mycenaeus immolated his wife on the butt at which he caught her one day quenching her thirst at the tap or the bung hole the ferocious romulus thought this act simple and natural he did not even reprimand the cruel husband 
another unfortunate creature discovered the place where her husband kept the keys of the cellar she took them and had the imprudent curiosity to go and visit the mysterious and inauspicious treasure to which she was forbidden all access her family perceived this innocent larceny and refused her every kind of food to punish her for an imaginary crime she died in the tortures of hunger is it necessary to speak of c domitius that uncourteous judge who deprived a lady of her marriage portion because she had taken the liberty to drink a spoonful or two of wine unknown to her lord and master but let us say it at once roman civilization put an end to such strange manners and so early as the age of augustus livia the consort of that emperor affirmed when eighty-two years old that she was indebted to bacchus for her long existence let us remark by the way that the great prince her husband honoured the labours of the vine-dresser and the serious study of wines to which little attention had been paid down to his time it began then to be understood that this grateful drink draws the ties of friendship closer and all honest people all generous souls were eager to taste it the good trajan quaffed off numberless cups every day of course he became the idol of the human species agricola wished to drink before he died the imbecile claudius often found some ray of wisdom at the bottom of an amphora domitian merited the pardon of his crimes thanks to the streams of wine which during the night ran from the fountains and caligula would perhaps have obtained that popularity which always failed him had he possessed sufficient sense to offer to the roman people the delicious falernian wine he allotted to his favourite horse the ladies ventured in the first place to wet their lips with a few drops of those light wines which the sun seemed to ripen for them at tibur in the environs of cumae and throughout campania after a short time they braved the falernian itself true they generally mixed it with iced water or snow but the boldest are reported to have risked that dangerous liquor without taking such timid precautions falernian was a noble wine they began to drink it as soon as it had reached its tenth year then it was possible to bear up against it when it was twenty years old it could only be mastered after it was diluted with water if older it was unconquerable it attacked the nerves and caused excruciating headache the ladies struggled a long time for the victory but alas the falernian always had the best of it tired out at length with so many useless efforts the wisest of them left it to their husbands and sought other beverages which possessed less dangerous charms greece and italy invented new drinks for them which had a well-merited vogue notwithstanding the discredit into which they have fallen for many centuries past our modern beauties would smile with an air of incredulity if we were to extol asparagus wine winter savoury wine wild marjoram wine parsley seed wine or those made from mint rue penny royal and wild thyme and yet these liquors were the delectable drinks of the most distinguished women of ancient rome of those women who could never find in the culinary productions of the entire universe anything sufficiently delicate or rare are we then to blame their taste or question our own leaving aside this knotty question which we do not feel ourselves called upon to resolve let us state that these different drinks were prepared in a very simple manner two handfuls of one of the above named plants were put into a butt of wort a pint of sapa and half a pint of sea water were added this wine was drunk by the greek and roman ladies at breakfast and was an excellent substitute for the salatum a drink prepared with ochre and which we can hardly believe to have been introduced by sensuality alone it frequently happened after a banquet that the wearied and palled stomach refused with loathing the least nourishment an intelligent slave failed not under such circumstances to present his languishing mistress with a cup of wormwood wine before she quitted her couch anon 
the livid paleness of her complexion brightened into the rosy hue of health the dimmed eye resumed its wonted lustre and that very evening the brilliant matron could seat herself fearlessly at a fresh banquet that precious wine that fashionable tonic which modern sobriety be it said to our praise has rendered almost useless sold well in rome under the reigns of the emperors it was composed by boiling a pound of wormwood in two hundred and forty pints of wort until it was diminished one-third there was also a more simple method of making it which was to throw a few handfuls of wormwood into a butt of wine the live wood or the leaves of the cedar the cypress the laurel the juniper tree or the turpentine tree boiled a long time in wort produced different bitter liqueurs to which intemperance complacently attributed benign qualities and numerous medical virtues equal praise may be accorded to hyssop wine that famous mixture of three ounces of the plant in twelve pints of wort its effects were surprising and the most popular physicians would not have failed to prescribe it for their languishing patients whose strength and gaiety it restored but thank heaven our roman beauties were not always obliged to have recourse to the gloomy experience of the disciples of aesculapius and when they were in good health more exhilarating liqueurs lent their aid to toast their return to health and pleasure they were then seen sipping myrtle wine a mild beverage the light vapours of which brought down calm and profound sleep it was wisdom to drink it for alas not all that would can sleep if the reader be troubled with wakefulness he will hail with joy the recipe for this beneficent narcotic let him take young myrtle branches with the leaves pound them and boil one pound in eighteen pints of white wine until it is reduced to two-thirds let him drink this liqueur of the roman ladies and without doubt he will sleep as they did the petite maîtresse those delicate women whose life seemed to be a tissue of vapours mingled with tears rome abounded with them would have fainted even at the smell of the wines made up in the manner indicated above their frail nervous organisation required a different kind of drink and one was invented for them the adinamon this adinamon or wine without strength was the most inoffensive of liqueurs it was obtained by boiling ten pints of water in twenty pints of white wort a small cup of this salutary beverage restored a debile cynthia a sickly julia when negligently seated at her toilet a boeotian slave brought a nosegay of lilies instead of a crown of roses these charming creatures would soon have lost the use of their senses if the adenamon had not been promptly applied to their lips but hardly had they tasted the marvellous liqueur when animation resumed its calm and peaceful course nay after the lapse of a few seconds they were enabled without any inconvenience whatever to witness the chastisement of the slave whose naked shoulders and breasts were lacerated by their orders with a thong studded with sharp points who after that would dare doubt the properties of the adinamon wine the unanthonum wine was destined for more vigorous constitutions for natures of less exquisite delicacy the roman ladies somewhat fond of rusticating who passed a part of the year in their villas prepared it by putting two pounds of wild vine flowers into a butt of wort they were left there thirty days and then the liquor was drawn off into other vessels such were the vinous drinks which fashion formerly brought into repute in the capital of the world the women set no bounds to their taste for these concocted wines but went on from one excess to another as long as the empire lasted these strange habits now buried under the roman colossus have been replaced by a new order of civilization woman that graceful being of whom antiquity was not worthy now appears such as christianity has made her to reveal to us virtues which ancient greece and italy never knew daughter wife and mother she consoles encourages and supports man amid the trials of life her sweet smile welcomes him at the cradle 
her prayer accompanies him to the tomb it was she who softened the ferocious instincts of the barbarous hordes that the forests of the north vomited over europe and still exercising her empire over modern society she is hailed as a queen whose virtues and chaste attractions render her the living embodiment of the flower and the angel those sweet symbols of love and beauty between which a modern poet has gracefully placed her throne the primitive inhabitants of great britain learned from the romans to plant the vine under the reign of the emperor probus the conquerors taught them also the art of cutting it and how to make wine but as strutt observes the wine could never be of any great utility in this country it was more ornamental than useful with the exception that it afforded the means of procuring a cool retreat and shade however some provinces of england became celebrated for their wines the county of gloucester is renowned for its vines says william of malsbury and the wines it produces are scarcely inferior to those of france st louis was the first who established statutes for the dealers in wine new ones were framed in fifteen eighty five and the dealers were then divided into four classes each of which was designated by a particular name namely the innkeepers the publicans the tavern keepers and the wine dealers by measure the innkeepers had accommodation for man and horse the publicans served drink with tablecloth and plates that is to say they might serve food and drink at the same time the tavern keepers served drink alone and the retail dealers could only sell it in considerable quantities at one time in sixteen eighty these four classes were reduced to two wine merchants and retail wine dealers under the reign of louis the fourteenth a great dispute arose concerning the relative merits of burgundy and champagne wines and the preference due to the one or the other this quarrel originated in a thesis maintained at the commencement of the seventeenth century at the medical school of paris in which it was asserted that the wine of bone in burgundy was not only the most agreeable but the most wholesome this thesis excited no murmur at the time from the thirteenth century the wine of bone had always enjoyed the highest reputation and no one dreamed of disputing it but forty years later they risked a proposition much more rash than the preceding one it was maintained in the same school that the wines of burgundy were not only preferable to those of champagne but that the latter attack the nerves cause a fermentation of the humours and infallibly bring on the gout in persons not naturally subject to it they fortified this incredible opinion with the authority of the celebrated fagon chief physician of louis the fourteenth who had just forbidden the king as they said the use of champagne wine the champagne people took fire it was time the dangerous heresy threatened to spread so they attacked the burgundians bravely the latter defended themselves with equal courage the battle waxed warm each party sought to crush their antagonists with heavy writings the inhabitants of burgundy pretended that the wine of champagne owed its vogue entirely to the influence of colbert and louvois the then ministers one of whom was a native of champagne and the other in possession of immense vineyards the champagne growers proved that this assertion was false in every particular long before the time of these two statesmen said they the french got tipsy on champagne wine ergo they valued that exhilarating liquor this argument was irrefragable they might have added that from the sixteenth century the wine of Aix, a canton of champagne enjoyed such renown that the emperor charles v pope leo x henry the eighth of england and francis i of france were anxious to possess this nectar and tradition assures us that each of these great sovereigns purchased a close at Aix in which a little house was built for a vine-dresser who sent them every year a stock of wine which enlivened their repasts the epicureans took part in this great discussion and that they might give their judgment after mature deliberation founded on a perfect knowledge of facts 
they have been tasting champagne and burgundy wines these two hundred years. May the vouchers in this suit never fail them. Wine was long used for presents and fees, a custom established under Charlemagne. After baptism, a marriage or a burial, the priests received the vicar's wine. Before marriage, wedding wine was offered to the intended bride, after a lawsuit, the councillor was presented with Clark's wine. The wine of citizenship was given to the mayor of a town in which any person took up his abode. This present subsequently took the name of pot de vin, or bribe, still in great favour. It has changed its character, certainly, but the variations have multiplied to infinity. In the Middle Ages, sober people intoxicated themselves regularly once a month. Arnaud de Villeneuve examined seriously the advantages of this hygienic custom. There was a kind of glory attached to the swallowing of more wine than any other man, without being non compos mentis. There was, however, a means of avoiding these bacchanalian encounters. It was to choose a champion who, as in judicial combats, accepted the challenges for his candidate, to whom the victory or defeat was attributed, as if he himself had drunk. In the Middle Ages, and in the 16th century, intoxication was severely punished in France. By five ordinances, in the years 802, 803, 810, 812, and 813, Charlemagne declares habitual drinkers unworthy of being heard before courts of justice in their own cause or as witness for another. Francis I decreed by an edict in the month of August 1536 that whosoever should be found intoxicated was to be imprisoned on bread and water for the first offence. The second time flogging in the prison was added. The third time he was publicly flogged and if the offender was incorrigible, his ears were cut off, he was deemed infamous, and banished the kingdom. Now everyone is free to quench his thirst, and drink more if he chooses. Quote by Strutt The craft to make Ipocras Take a quart of red wine, an ounce of cinnamon, and half an ounce of ginger, a quarter of an ounce of grains, and long pepper, and half a pound of sugar, and brose all this, not too small, and then put them in a bag of woollen cloth, made therefore, i.e. for that purpose, with the wire, and it hang over a vessel till the wine be run through. End of quote. The English were extremely partial to a drink they called clary, or clar. According to Arnold, it was compounded in the following manner. For eighteen gallons of good wine, take half a pound of ginger, quarter of a pound of long pepper, an ounce of saffron, a quarter of an ounce of coliander, two ounces of calomel dramaticus, and the third part as much honey that is clarified as of your wine. Strain them through a cloth, and do it unto a clean vessel. John, in the first year of his reign, made a law that a ton of Rochelle wine should not be sold for more than twenty shillings, a ton of wine from Anjou for twenty-three shillings, and a ton of French wine for twenty-five shillings, except some that might be of the very best sort, which was allowed to be raised to twenty-six shillings and fourpence, but not for more in any case. By retail, a gallon of Rochelle wine was to be sold for fourpence, and a gallon of white wine for sixpence, and no dearer. End of section 30